my name is Judy. Um, I love the show. I uh, love both yeah. you and Kenzie. Um, I wanted to find out what did you do to challenge, uh, channel Kenzie's character when the body switching episode happened? <laughs> because you did that so fabulously. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, uh, one, I have an amazing actress to study. Oh, Chris Holden Reed. So true. <laughs> Who uh, was so generous with me? I would actually go over to Kenzie's house and we would do the scenes together, and we would videotape each other doing our lines. So um, got to get some of the intonation from that. And then you know there was a couple little dance moves that I've seen her do over the years, that I just incorporated into my own dance style. <laughs> the craziest part about that was when um, we see and I had to kiss and I had to be him kissing Kiara and, and me and Casey would get them to do it like over and over again and see like, like where does his hand go, like how does he kiss her, how does he look at her and we would film it and like analyze, analyze, analyze. So. And it was so funny because you know I'm, I'm taller so yeah. I'm, I'm holding Lena in a certain and way. Casey's like here on me, I'm like ah. Uh. She's like ah. <laughs> and Casey, of course, is such a dude. He's like, I, I don't bend like that. <laughs> so, so There's a lot of them. It was a great episode for us to do. Next. Uh, yes, Cherry. So, what has been your favorite episode? Well, 209, the, the one we were just talking about, was definitely up at the top. For, I think, all of us. Yes. I also have one in season three, though, that I guess I can't <laughs> you tell us another one. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, um, 306. 306. Again, we, we're together. We're together, and it's all, yeah, it's me yeah. and Chris going crazy. Going here. places you never thought we'd go. Yeah. Let's just say growlings involved. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also love 205, which was the Brotherhood of the Faith, because we got to see some of Dyson's backstory. And, you know, I love bringing the period piece stuff. I really think it blows out the show and really gives it a bit of depth. Uh, history and experience. And I hope to see more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Question here. Hi, thank you. I'm Anna. Um, now that you're in the U.S., is there a difference between what is allowed to be shown in terms of censorship and editing? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Actually, I get in trouble for this a bit, apparently. Uh, Sci-fi is a minute and a half shorter. So I have to cut a minute, a minute and a half out of every show, which is torture. Yeah. Absolute torture. And sometimes one character loses a minute, a uh, few seconds, the other character, sometimes the story changes. But sci-fi has been super supportive. Uh, it's an effort every time to keep the exact same story. Uh, I don't cut the sexuality, I don't cut any of the things that people are worried about. It's tough to tell the story a minute and a half shorter, but uh, it's, I think we're pulling it off. Or is it a minute and a half back on the DVDs? Yeah, that minute has back on the DVD. So the DVD will have, and actually it does make a difference sometimes, you know, but uh, we get the same story every time. Next? Uh, yes, you, no, you, you, oh, sorry, yeah. I don't know your name, the woman Jim. behind you. Oh, oh yes, my name's Sheree. Uh, kind of along those lines, Jay, if you had an opportunity to air this on a premium cable channel, what level would you take it? Uh, we'd be stepping it up. I mean, when we originally started this thing, uh, the rules were uh, tougher than we thought as to what we could do. And it's very funny to say, let me show this much at the top of the butt, you know? And uh, you can only shine. You have to measure it every time. It's really awkward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I can see him having to say, Chris, going, oh, I've got to cover her here when I'm doing this. It's strategic you know, replacement. Yeah. And the girls are doing this, and everybody's watching what they do. And, uh, so that makes it actually, that is a, a hard to do. Uh, and since it's a very important show that the sexuality gets shown each week, uh, I think we pull it off, but it would be nice if we had a little less restriction. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yes, sir. So, um, Kinsey and Hale, more friends, uh, friends with benefits. Um, <laughs> uh, there's definitely a chemistry there. Of, can you give us a... A hint of where it's going? Yeah, because then I would ruin where it's going. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they have a special bond. I think they connect on on many levels, um, and and they're there for each other, and they have fun, and, and they tease each other and challenge each other um, as far as where it's going to go and who feels what. I don't know if I can reveal that. Fair. Big girl, big girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're asking, they're like, like the sidekick club. They just kind of, because they both You know, them. yeah, they have these people that they truly care about and love, and they definitely connect that way. Yeah. It's 
Yes. Hi, Christiane. I just wanted to know what kind of, in season three, what are we going to see with the dark fave kind of sinister characters are we going to have? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're shaking it a bit up in season three. Uh, you've seen a lot of the white fave world. We're going to show you more of the dark. Yes, sir. Um, now, Cassidia, you are obviously the only one that seems to not have any powers yet. They, um, a lot well, of don't sci-fi. Don't say that like it's a bad thing. Who we follow, of course. And uh, a lot of these sci-fi shows will turn a human character and like, let's give him power, let's turn him into something else. Um, would you want to see her go down the road to somehow suddenly get some fake powers? Or would you rather stay sort of human? <laughs> you know, I think I've had a good taste of like being the human and having to rely um, on, you know, Kenzie's courage and fearlessness. I feel like that's almost her power at this point. I, I won't lie, I think it's really exciting, the thought of having a fake power and, and being able to play around and kind of, you know, be at par with all my fake friends and, and be able to do more stunts and more action in that way by using some sort of fake power when we're putting situations where I'm going to fight and, and um, so, you know, yeah, of, of course I've thought about it and, you know, we'll see. What would that power be? Would you want That's a very good question that I never know how to answer. Um, something awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like in a perfect world, you know, I feel like Kenzie's power would be used for good if she could like stop a war with a joke. I mean, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be pretty nice. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I got begged yes. in one of the interviews uh, here to not let Kenzie ever have it. Yeah, someone was very upset. Somebody was very upset, <laughs> almost saying, please don't give her a power. You know, and it was that kind of plea. And uh, the response I got is that she is more impressive than anybody sometimes because she has no powers, but she stands her up. Well, that's what you said in 209. You know, you're weak, you're, you're frail, and the strongest person I know. Yeah, touching moment, everybody cry. My friend over there. Adam from Germany. Hi. Hi. Uh, guten Tag. Guten Tag. One of the things that makes Lost Girls are the one-liners, and I'm wondering what Ken Kensianism is your favorite one, and have you ever come up with one yourself? Like on set, for example. There's been some ad-libbing. Sometimes it's kept, sometimes it's not kept. Um, but, um, you know, if I'm really in the moment, it's so sometimes something comes to mind. Um, I've had so many, and they've all like mixed into one because of how many episodes we've done. But something that stands out, and that someone actually reminded me about uh, yesterday, was uh, a, an episode where Anna and I did the speed dating, and uh, Kenzie sits down in front of this unassuming gentleman, and he asks her what her favorite quote about regret is, and she goes, "My favorite literary quote about regret." Hmm. Let me see. Well, as the, the great poet Ludacris once said, <laughs> regret is for suckers, for suckers, for suckers. Regret is for suckers, bitch. <laughs> and she just, she just thought she was pretty smart in that <laughs> So that was, that was one of my favorites. It was so fun to, to fill the, film those scenes. Great. Yes, Jean. Um, for Dyson, it seems like, um, and this is a two-part question, uh, with Trick, there seems to be a lot of history uh, with you and Trick, you've obviously known each other for centuries. Um, is there going to be more revelations of how much you and Trick know, especially about Bo's background? Because obviously Trick knows something that hasn't been revealed yet, obviously, and we're getting really deep into season two here. So is that going to be revealed either later in the season or in season three? We have talked about this, and uh, there is we have ideas about more period flashbacks, part of the flashbacks, but where they meet. Because it's in 205 when we do the Brotherhood of the Wolf, you see Dyson go off and he's like basically on a line. So we don't know when Trick and him actually started, when he gave his allegiance to Trick. So we and at the same time in season three, we sort of give you a couple of hints that Trick has chosen Dyson. Uh, and then the second part of that question is um, also with the Ash, there seems to be a lot of contention between Dyson and the Ash, even though he's, you know, trying to, you know, do his bidding because he's a light fae, that's the leader of the light fae, but where is the contention? Is that going to be revealed of where the contention is coming from? Because it's obvious that you've known him before. Well, we're talking about Lachlan, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, Dyson just doesn't trust Lachlan. He doesn't think she, he has the most best interests at heart. Um, and, you know, like in his core, he's a protector. He's a defender. You know, he, 
that's one of his sort of base sort of um, character traits. And uh, so he will he will act aggressive towards anybody who makes a threat for the book. And that, that wherever you guys are, he still thinks that. Great, Jimmy. Yeah, uh, Chris. Now um, you just said how you what your detective character is and your light side. Uh, you're cursed, of course, to not fall up there again. Seeing that kind of thing. Uh, but um, <laughs> but uh, I'm curious. So um, could you be cursed maybe to go dark side, and would you want it to go dark side? What would be an adversary though? Um, that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, we've gotten to explore a lot with dice in the last two seasons. Um, it's been a pretty dark road for Dyson in season two. And, uh, you know, I, I think it will either bring him back or we can push him further. And, yeah, I mean, I love playing back ass. It's so fun. So, um, I don't know. It's, 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 it's all. you in Underworld yeah. in Lost Girl. That's right. <laughs> Evil wolf. Needles in the eye. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be definitely interested in exploring that. That'd be a lot of fun. Next, yes. Um, going to season three, and uh, you've gone through a lot since then. Are there any other aspects of the character that you wish to be further explored? I'm Christina from Singapore, by the way. Wow. Um, we need a backstory. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have such a, you know, the Fey world is so raw and we pull from so many historical, mythological, folklore things that we have such a vast uh, research, vast amount of research material that we can pull from. And I would love to, if we had the time, I mean, law school takes place in a very sort of isolated, one city, one group of people. I wish we had the time and the budget, maybe if we do a feature film, we can like, <laughs> I would love to see us, you know, like travel the world, like, we, we have we have these abilities to teleport. We found some of these some of these fey, you know, that we could go to Singapore and shoot in Singapore, and that you know I would love to bring in more of an international feel to the show, so it doesn't feel uh, feel so rural and colloquial. That I would use good words. I know I can't <laughs> so well. Great, Cherry. I was wondering, what are the personality traits of yourselves as normal people that you bring into the characters that you're playing? That's <laughs> <laughs> um, a very interesting question. Obviously, a huge Ludacris fan. <laughs> huge Ludacris fan. My whole performance is based on my love for Ludacris. You know what, though? You, she, Cassandra is a massive lover of music, and that definitely was part of Kenzie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when we started, you know, the show, I always felt like I. I was like, oh God, how are they going to cast me? Like, I'm just so, I'm so not funny. Like, my entire career, I played very dramatic roles, and I'm so the, the comedy aspect was like so overwhelming and and and, and challenging, and, and it's just something that I'd never done before. And I always didn't, I didn't know that I had like a sense of humor. Like, I didn't comedy or laughing or none of that. I mean, obviously, I laugh and I love good jokes, but I feel like the more I play Kenzie, the more almost I become her in my own life, and I, I realized that I love to laugh, and I love to make people laugh, and comedy has kind of become such a huge love of mine. Um, so I think it kind of works both ways. Uh, Kenzie gives me that, and I feel like maybe I give Kenzie, um, you know, a sense of loyalty. I'm, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my friends and family, and I cherish them you know, with every fiber of my being, and I, and I understand, you know, that loyalty, so, so what she feels for Bo, I, I, you know, I, I, I feel it, and I, I can understand it, so I, I hope that things are good for Your turn. My turn, wow. Um. He's brooding and sexy in real life, so. <laughs> But I'm also a total goofball. He's a total, like him as Kenzie in episode 209 was actually the real Chris. And really cool. <laughs> like his, his real self finally got to come out. That's, that's why true. he had so much fun. It, it's, you know, Dyson is, uh, I think what, um, what I have to really focus on with Dyson is the fact that he's like a millennia and a half old. And so I really pulled from the more serious side, the serious parts of myself, which has been nice to focus on. You know, I. I Sandy's not joking. I, I am like, I like to have fun, and I'm, I'm a bit of a 
Scott you're Kenzie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Kenzie in, in, inside. Um, so yeah, to, to focus on, you know, to bring out the integrity, you know, I, I think I am a man of integrity, so that's kind of what I grounded it on. And, uh, and just, yeah, you know, that uh, the seriousness that experience can bring you, that nothing really surprises you, that there's, you know, that you consider all aspects and that you have seen as many perspectives as possibly can. You know, a wisdom, I think, that's, that's what I sort of grounded Great, our friends from Germany. <laughs> Another question from Senior and maybe for the rest of us too, but I'm not too sure about that. Both you and Anna Silk have the most spectacular collection of clothes on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, do you get to keep any of them? And there also seem to be a lot of shots of boots and shoes in the show series. <laughs> Is this on purpose or not? I don't know, James. Yeah, the, boot, the boots and shoes are on purpose. It's, the a, boots common, have like a, it's a common line. They have like a life of their own on the show. Yeah. Um, I got to write an episode once and I made them in salter boots. Which did not go to the at all. I, our wardrobe is so amazing. Ann Dixon, who, who was our wardrobe designer for the first two seasons, just, I mean, we are so lucky. From tailor fitted, you know, leather vests for Chris and, and jackets and pants. And, and I mean, she's just, I don't think anybody else could have created the look of this show. Uh, for myself, every time I have a wardrobe fitting, I'm like, oh my God, can you guys buy me one of these so I can take them home? Um, the shoes, Kenzie can't live uh, in flats. So no matter what it is, even if, uh, you know, we have episodes where I, like, have to be running through the forest, like gravel, like for it doesn't matter. If I had to be uh, running through a volcano, I would still be in, like, high-heeled shoes. Um, and, you know, it's, it's separate pieces, like jackets. Um, I have this one gray jacket that's very, like, Lady Gaga-esque. I actually went out and bought that jacket for myself and I wear it in my real life. And um, Kenzie's jeans, um, I have these really cool jeans called Heart Attacks and they're red and they have like laces and zippers. And so everything she has is very uh, not typical standard look. And it's a really eclectic mix of so many different styles. So all the time I'm like, I wish I was cool enough to wear that in my real life. That piece, maybe I can pull off, maybe I can't, but I always want to take it with home. And you know, maybe one day, one day in the future when we're done this crazy show, Jay will. Well, actually, he's, he's stealing all our clothes all the time. That's like, true. Not yours. The wardrobe that's true. Office. I lose weight to steal his. <laughs> he's always stealing our clothes. That's why we can't get him. Great. Um, Chris, Christine, right? Christine. Oh, no, Christina, no. Sorry, what was your name again? Cherie. Cherie, sorry. Cherie, Jimmy, <coughs> then you? Brian. Brian, great. So should we? Uh, this question is for Jay and Ksenia. Uh, the writers have alluded to drop little snippets of Kenzie's past. Are we going to get to see more of Kenzie's backstory? Oh, well, well, we have a lot of fun with Kenzie's backstory. She's uh, much more complex than you see uh, so far. So we love doing it. Every time she's in a situation where she has to perform some undercover operation, she usually gets to flash back to something she did in her earlier days. So, you know, I think she's pretty complex. I hope, I, I really hope yeah. that as we, as we go on, we really delve more into her backstory because it's just as crazy as, as she is. And I, I would love for the fans to be able to see where this girl came from. Like, who is she really? What made her who she is? And, everything she had to deal with when she was living on the streets and with her stepdad and mafia connections and like, you know, it's just so, it's such a vibrant, vibrant backstory that she has, so I would love to see that. There's a little thing in season three without giving anything away where we use a Wizard of Oz sort of reference, and I love it. And then it sort of talks about where she came from. Great, Jimmy. <laughs> that was good, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> that should represent. Um, <laughs> now, Kenzie talk about your background there, um, she's a survivor, and uh, it seems like it will take anything to survive, and sort of relation to what I asked Chris, um, you think Kinsey could go down a dark road, and, and you know, she's not fake, but maybe work for the dark side against Bo, actually, I don't know, like, that's what that, you know, not come to form it, you know, would you like I to I feel like the again? entertaining answer would be, yeah, of course, <laughs> who knows, but, you know, I feel like the only thing that could even, not get in the way of her though, because I really feel like they're just attached. Earlier I said at the heart, not at the hip, they're attached at the heart. 
So it would have to take, you know, earth, wind, and fire to, to take her away from Bo. Um, but I think the fact that, you know, when Nate comes into her life, he kind of introduces this whole idea of you can have a normal life, and we can run away, and you can be happy, and I can make you happy. And I think that's just something the seed has been planted, you know, and I think it's only fair for Kenzie to think about that. I think it's only fair for her to have love and to be happy and, and you know, She's going to get older. No one's going to get older. She's going to get older in age. And, and, you know, what if she wants a kid? Or, like, what if she wants, like, experience, like, normal human things? It's, it's something that I think she's kind of slowly maybe going to start to ponder. Great. Brian. Yes. Can you touch upon some of the big contrasts uh, that we can expect next season compared to the previous? Uh, well... The only thing I could really say without giving too much away is you've seen a lot of the light side of the world they live in, and we want to show you a little more of the dark side. And that info, that has an impact on pretty much everybody. Does it ever? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anna? Yeah, about the clothing before you shoot right now, pretty hot. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you steal those from work? <laughs> no. Um, so my question is for the actors, um, how, have, how do you guys feel your characters have evolved from season one until now? And where do you, if you have a place, where do you want them to go? Or where do you want them to change? The first. All right. Um, you know, it's an, an interesting alchemy that happens between what your character's going through and what you're going through as the artist as well. Like, uh, season one, everything was fresh for us. We were creating the show. There was a lot of excitement. We, we, we were developing the world as, that we, as we were doing it. Season two, you get a little, you know, you know, you know what you're doing. So then that, that kind of experience also translates into your character. You're, for Dyson, I was going through a lot of darker stuff. And, um, in season three, I think we really found our stride. You know, it's like you—we really all, as artists, know what the show is about now, and uh, we know our characters so well that the two sort of really run parallel lines of, you know, of higher and higher ex experience and things that we can perform and bring to the show as well. So I'm really excited about season three and season four. Um, I agree with Chris, it so much depends on also what you're going through in your life. I feel like when I started the show, I, I was, I mean, not that I'm not young now, but I was younger and I, <laughs> I don't laugh, um, I was younger and I feel like Kenzie was really just like a kid off the streets, you know, pickpocketing, stealing, whatever she had to do just to survive, just to make it through the day. And when she met Bo, she met her family and she got a, a purpose in life, which I feel that she never really had before. And I think so ever since then, we've, she's just been maturing and growing and, and um, really, I feel, you know, becoming a warrior in her own right. Um, so, and as for me, I, I've been maturing and I've been growing up. So I feel like she's really, you know, changing from a kid into a woman and she's trying to find her, her place in this crazy world that, that she's in. And one thing that happens on the production level is the writers now get input from the actors as to what they think their character is because uh, Kenzie knows who Kenzie is and Dyson knows who Dyson is because they've lived it. You know, so I think they so have a lot of Kenzie's We are not our characters. <laughs> <laughs> but they get, no, no, but, they, but they, they actually know themselves and they know what they would do and what they would say or what their character would say. So they have more input with the writers, and, and that's a natural sort of growth of production. Next question. Um, <clears throat> deep, I so I mentioned this to Jay in the back. How has it been working on a show that has had sexuality without declaration? You know, Bo has a relationship with two different people, but it's never set up a situation of asking the question of, of sexual orientation. I, and I love that aspect, that it's, it's about relationships with people. It's not about male or female, it's about basically partners. Yeah. How's it been working on you? Have you guys seen any kind of feedback from that or any, seen any pushback? Well, I think it's pretty evident in just our, in our fan base of who's enjoying the show. You know, we, we're, we're, not a, we're, not a, we're not a gay show, we're not a bi show, we're not a straight show. We, we do touch on all these sort of different worlds without judgment or, um, or um, you know, uh, 
that's where I was going. Ah, mind freeze. Without anyway, without judging. Yeah, no, it's like <laughs> thanks, man. <buddy. laughs> um, so yeah, and and I think that that is you know the definitely one of the beauties of the show, and also one of the truths of relationships. You know, it's it's not about what sexual orientation you are. It's about how you love it and if you can and, and how you do that. I really like that about Lost Girl. Um, I was hoping for a few more threesomes myself this year. <laughs> <laughs> next year, maybe next year. Great, next question. I'm sorry. I'm Angela, sorry, from Other Entertainment. And you have a very big female fan base. And many of those females are so engrossed into the genre of with dealing with books, with other types of stories, movies. I mean, you guys gather a lot of your background and your future of the episodes from a lot of um, of that genre that has already been out there dealing with the Fae, or is it something that you just go by? And I mean, do you guys personally look into it? I mean, with yourselves? Well. I think, you know, it's kind of like there, there's that old saying, there's no new stories, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we definitely pull from stuff that is already in the genre. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you can really avoid that. Um, as far as personal research, I mean, absolutely I research. Where, I mean, I, I've read so many different books that deal with shifting and all kinds of different sci-fi and fantasy stuff that I had all kinds of different sort of little things that I could pull from for that. So, um, as far as the show goes, I know we're constantly following. We do. We have a big challenge for the writing department because every episode we try to take a social issue or a relationship issue or an emotional issue, and we try to match it up with a mythological creature. And that's a really huge challenge. So that we had uh, a creature who wanted to live off your feeling of shame. You know, so we had to deal with people who have some uh, self-confidence issues. Some. Uh, insecurities and this guy could cheat off them. So and we did some father-son relationships, we did some best friend relationships, and we've had creatures that have challenged those. So we work, I, I think it's one of the special things about our shows. We're actually not copying anybody else's things because mm -hmm. that matching of a social issue, a relationship issue, emotional issue with the creature, I don't think anybody's ever done. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm calling you Germany, but what's your name? <laughs> My name is Adam. I'm sorry? Adam. Adam, okay, Adam. Um, I was wondering, you're such a cult show, and um, when we introduced your show on our website, we compared it to Buffy, the vampire series. And I want to know what you think about those uh, comparisons, because we had a heated debate in our community about <laughs> that comparison, if it's valid or not. Yeah, yeah. So all of us? Yeah. Totally. I think I think you're the most qualified. Yeah, I, I have to be honest, I read the first couple chapters of the Buffy handbook, uh, at the beginning of this. And uh, when I sat with the writers, the original concept, uh, the very, very script was very, very uh, hard, vixen, sexy, and rough. You know, there wasn't a lot of comedy, it wasn't as much fun when we first were developing this. And then one day, uh, I don't know, we were just goofing around about it, and everybody said, don't compare it to Buffy, don't say Buffy. And even the writers have said to me, Jay, come on, that's a high hurdle for us to reach, you know. But I pushed it a fair bit with them, that I want that sort of sensibility, uh, that fun. And we do, we, I mean, we sort of strive it. One episode actually came out, and somebody said, oh my god, I saw this on Buffy, and we had to throw it out. We had to throw out the whole script, that it was too similar to the Buffy episode. But, uh, uh, listen, there's a lot of comparisons to it, uh, but we sort of like when I when actually I was developing this uh, at a cafe in Cannes during the film festival, I said to somebody, "What would Buffy be?" Twenty years later, and that was a question I asked, and I got a lot of input on that. So. Uh, Chair, yes. So your fan base is passionate. He loves you. Is obsessed with you. Have you guys started getting fan art or? really personal, especially from people who are gay or, or lesbian or don't look like the ideal of what people think they look like, because your show is one of the ones that show people that look unlike most people who look on TV, you know, people are short, some of them are fat, some are, you know, less than perfect looking. I mean, it's such diverse. <laughs> 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 We're very lucky. We have uh, incredible. 
incredible, incredible fans. Um, really just did. yesterday, we got this beautiful um, kind of portrait of, of, four of, of the four of us. A trick, Asenia, myself, and Anna Jo. It was a beautiful hand done portrait. Yeah, and, and just it seems like anytime we're lucky enough to kind of meet our fans at, at one of these events, everyone always, not everyone, but quite a few people come with beautiful yeah. photos, portraits, and it's, it's just so humbling and it's so. You know, it's just so amazing that people take the time and are inspired, you know, to, 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 to do these pieces for us. Or even, I've seen so many of the videos that people cut together on, online, and honestly, I am so astounded by some of these people's yeah. um, editing sound. Like, <laughs> I want them to cut my demo reel. Like, <laughs> they, they, make, they make us look so good. And, and yeah, we're honestly really grateful and, and, and humbled by the, the response. We, we didn't know. You never know when you're creating something. I'm really glad that there's actually a written, since we're talking about this, there was a director who came on the show, uh, a guest director, and he said that the reason he thinks the reason why the show is so successful is because all of us in real life have such great connections, and I'm so glad that those friendships transcend through the screen and through the show out there. And that, you know, the love and trust we feel for each other on set is. Uh, I think that's part of the show's dynamic. I'm so glad that it goes through the medium and that people feel that through, through the work and through the television. As a producer, I'm very lucky because these guys are all having fun. They all work well together. They're total pros. And it's, our reputation is the most fun production to work on. Very yeah, it is. And it shows. It shows. Everybody's happy. Everybody's friends. Everybody moves around. When they have the time. When they have the time. It's a tight schedule. No, but seriously, I've had directors call me up and say, I want to work on your show. I hate cop shows. I hate doing this. I hate doing procedural stuff. They don't hate it. They're just tired. Sorry, they're just tired. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't say it. <clears throat> they're just tired of it. And we have a reputation and it's fun. And I mean, these guys, like, they, you can really see that they enjoy working with each other. Great. Sue, are there any scenes that you guys have actually filmed that you that were deleted or you know, removed from us that you wished had been put into the episode. There's one that actually pops into my mind. I always think about this in the body switching episode. There was a scene where Kenzie as Dyson goes uh, to oh, yeah, the Ashes yeah. compound, and one of her um, work, one of his oh, God, workmates from you know his police whatever friend um, is there, and he's you know standing guard, and Dyson. God, this is so confusing. Dyson, as Kenzie, has to go and talk to his friend, and obviously this friend just thinks, you know, it's a human standing in front of me, and he's not very nice. And and Dyson, in this awkward state, you know, tries to seduce his friend so he could let him in. And, and the scene was just, I was very much looking forward to doing it. Unfortunately, because of time restrictions, we had to cut it out of the episode, but it was it's just one that I always think about, and I think, oh my God, it would have been so much fun, you know, to be Chris, and you know, he's you know touching his shirt, and he feels so awkward in his body, and and, and you know, looking at Kenzie, and flirting with a dude that he knows, and flirting with a dude that, with he, dude that he works with. Yeah. That I remember was we worked that scene together, but we talked about yeah. it. Yeah. 